Hi everyone, welcome to this second masterclass where we will be talking about um, feminism. So just a quick outline of what we will be discussing today. I'll give a quick introduction to feminism and some key concepts to keep in mind. Um, and then we'll talk briefly about intersectionality. We'll go over the major perspectives in feminism um, and then we'll cover the common debates and let's talk about the gender gap evidence base and what kind of data is needed to make the case for a particular intervention. So I'll give you some examples, but uh, it, it should just give you a flavor of how to gather and present evidence. So just a quick um, introduction. What is feminism? And I've broken this down into three uh, key strands. And these strands are obviously interrelated, right? Um, but some debates or some conversations focus a bit more on one of the three. So the first way of thinking about it is, is a way of thinking about the world. It's a hat you put on. It's a theoretical perspective you take. It's your lens for seeing the world, right? Um, the second way of looking at it is that it's an organized political struggle or advocacy so that there, that there is an action component to it. People are trying to change policy. People are trying to influence uh, social behaviors. And finally, it's something that people practice in their own lives. And the personal is political is a very um, popular sl slogan in feminism. I'm sure many of you have heard about it. Um, a big chunk of feminist belief, I think maybe most feminists believe that in order to change and reimagine the world, we need to start with ourselves. We need to start with personal sites, our families, our own relationships, our own practices and beliefs. And you're likely to see motions across a wide range of, um, of, these, of these topics, even including the last one increasingly. Now, feminists broadly agree that everyone should have equal rights and opportunities. So it's quite hard to pin down feminism, but I think this is the most reasonable common denominator that you know, all these three, perspect uh, three ways of thinking about it have. At the same time, I think it's important to emphasize that not all feminists think alike. First, they don't understand the causes of inequality in the same way. So for some of them, certain factors are more prominent in their explanations, right? Second, because they define problems differently, the solutions they support and propose uh, will vary as well. So for example, feminism has been used to defend and reject pornography, prostitution, polygamy, police, uh, collaboration with the police, and many other practices and ideas. So a lot of academic and um, policy debates, right, require you to defend a perspective or to prioritize specific goals or groups over others. So they're often like competing interests or tensions within feminism, right? Now, what does intersectionality mean and why is it such an important uh, concept that must underpin uh, feminist conversations? So the first thing I want to start with is to say that most women share some experiences by virtue of being women, right? Uh, obviously, the way we experience these things will vary in extents depending on our access to power, our race, our class background. But it is fair to say that to varying extents, many women experience these things, right? Women have been historically deprived of freedom through a combination of formal and informal political, moral, social, and economic regulations. Um, denied voting rights, uh, experienced restrictions on movement. Some countries, for example, don't even let low-waged women migrant workers uh, leave without the consent of their husbands or fathers because it's seen as an abrogation of their motherly duties, right? Um, or as a way of protecting them against trafficking. Um, reproductive and domestic burdens, which for the longest time and even now isn't always seen as uh, productive, isn't seen as valuable or prestigious, and it's often invisibilized and kind of just expected and extracted for free. Um, women are more likely to be subject to economic restrictions on property ownership or working outside the home, restrictions on their speech and dress, especially because uh, notions of good womanhood are usually underpinned by notions of modesty, um, submission, not you know, not going out of line, not challenging male authority too much. Um, women are on balance denied political representation or the ability to advocate for themselves. And if you look at uh, the ratio of global leaders, we'll talk about that in a bit. Women are heavily underrepresented, 
and women have been historically denied sexual and reproductive rights and connected to the previous one, a lot of decisions around abortion, access to contraception, etc., have actually been made by men, right? Now, having said that, I want to draw your attention to different types of women and ask you to reflect on whether they share the same identity, right? And my argument is they don't. So think about first world female corporate executives and the access to resources and power that they have and the female domestic helpers that they hire, perhaps, right? So it's quite easy for Yahoo CEO Marissa Myers to say, I don't get the fuss. Why do people say pregnant this pregnancy thing is so hard? It isn't. But she can also install an office for her newborn right next, uh, space for her newborn right next to her office, which is not something most women can, right? Um, now think of the situation of female domestic workers who are likely to be subjected to uh, inequality before the law as it stands to forms of racialized violence and abuse. Some of them have undocumented migration status, which makes them even more precarious. For many of them, they would have entered into debt already in order to acquire these jobs overseas. Um, and obviously the guilt and uh, sadness they feel at being away from their own families, these are not the same life experiences or situations, right? Or even black women and white women and their relationship with the police, historically policies on domestic violence and um, sexual violence in general um, that were advocated for by middle to upper class white women tend to have the criminal justice system as a primary solution uh, and tend to feature police-led responses. So like reporting, um, arrests, uh, lawsuits, and the penal system as a solution. And Black women, obviously not all, and these are not absolute categories. Obviously, class also plays a role here. Respectability plays a role here. But on balance, Black feminists are very critical of this uh, police-centric carceral approach to violence against women. And their argument is, of course, it also happens in our communities, but this, the police are not the solution. And it is quite likely that if we call a cop, uh, the violence will escalate, right? And on principle, any intervention that feeds into the expansion of police powers is likely to backfire in our communities because of the difficult relationship our communities have with cops, i.e. they are killing us, right? Um, so think about celebrity feminists like Taylor Swift, and obviously it's great that they are using their voice, but um, which voices then are considered authoritative, legitimate, and might it crowd out other voices is also a thing to think about. And even among celebrities, the social cachet that, you know, pretty white celebrities have relative to others, um, the debate between secular feminists, which tends to be the dominant stream in Western societies and uh, feminists in post-colonial societies, perhaps, who argue that they shouldn't have to choose between their feminist credentials and their you know, belief in their religion is also quite an interesting uh, fault line. Um, sex workers, who in my work I show, have been <laughs> historically screwed over by the feminist movement um, because they're seen as you know, complicit in the perpetuation of the patriarchy and long-suffering victims, which we will talk about in a little bit. But, you know, somehow no one seems to mind that male factory workers might be complicit in the propagation of predatory capitalism, but somehow the sex workers are meant to save us from the patriarchy. Um, the position of trans women as well within feminism is precarious, and this is really, really unfortunate because there are certain strains of feminism that you know, refuse to consider trans women women or refuse to allow them access to the same set of rights as cis women. So ultimately, sex intersects, sex, the biological sex that you're assigned, which I argue is also a construct, intersects with race, class, religion, and women have diverse experiences and access to power and economic opportunities. All right. So, I want to walk you through the major perspectives in feminism, but I also want you to not think of these things as rigid categories. Think of it as a conversation among perspectives, because what I'm giving you is ideal types. Each perspective has its own little sub-debates. And in fact, I would argue many of these perspectives have more in common than not. So the reason I am introducing it this way to you is because in our limited time, it allows me to highlight key points of disagreement. But when you are deploying these frameworks in your own lives, 
or in your own academic writing or, or debates and conversations, you don't need to stick strictly to just one framework. Like in all likelihood, you can borrow from different frameworks and apply according to what makes sense to context, right? Or, to, or develop your own feminist ethics. So let's start with liberal feminism. And again, these are ideal types, right? These feminists tend to think that women's oppression is rooted in the legal and political um, constraints in the public sphere. So for them, individual agency and free choice are the most important things. And they think these things exist once we remove these formal constraints in the public sphere. So their focus is usually on calling for change in political procedures, practices, and institutions to enable an equal playing field for men and women. But for them, once this is done, right, once we've dismantled discriminatory hiring practices, discriminatory inheritance laws, once we've dismantled uh, formal obstacles to women running for public office and voting, all other outcomes are a matter of personal choice and therefore not relevant to politics or should not be subjected to political intervention. So even if women are still lagging behind and even if you have a gender gap, they would argue that that's women choosing, right? Socialist feminists don't quite agree with this and have a more structural conception of the problem. So for them, women's oppression is a product of capitalistic political and economic structures. So according to this group of feminists, the ruling group, men, and they would lump in here elite women as well as extensions of the patriarchy, right? Um, not only control the means of production, but also the production of ideology, the ideas one lives by, right? Um, and to some extent, a good, a good example of this is how economics as a discipline has evolved. Before the 1960s, the emphasis has been on uh, measurable indicators in the public sphere. Uh, even the way GDP was measured, um, only track, it only tracked uh, public acts of consumption, for example, uh, or productivity. It never tracked like women's invisible labor in the household. So, and obviously, as feminist economics entered the scene and pushed back against this way of measuring progress or measuring labor, we now have more sophisticated conceptions of, of, uh, of work, right? Um, though the argument of socialist feminists is domestic work, childcare, and marriage are ways in which women are exploited by a patriarchal system which devalues women and the substantial work they do. But actually, the capitalist system is reliant on this free labor that women provide, right? So they, this, some people would term this social reproduction. Um, basically, who keeps the worker alive so that the capitalist can then extract value from the worker? And so they argue that it is women's labor that essentially subsidizes the capitalist system. Um, obviously, you can expand this to women and feminized populations, depending on the context, or marginalized or racialized um, <clears throat> groups. Um, so for socialist feminists, this is not a question of men versus women. And they are quite open to working alongside not just men, but all other groups, because the oppression of women is part of a larger system that affects everyone involved in the capitalist system. And the radical feminists, who share a lot in common with the socialist feminists, but where, where socialist feminists might emphasize class, radical feminists tend to overplay, if not emphasize the gender component, right? Um, and radical feminism has many strains, so I'm just going to try to represent the dominant strain. Um, they tend to identify certain traits as predominantly female. For example, community orientedness, connection, capacity for caring. And the opposites of these are identified as predominantly male. So for example, assertiveness, individualism, aggression, rationality. Now, they don't quite agree on whether these differences are inherent or biological. Some of them would argue that. Some of them would argue that it's socialization, but because this socialization is so deep seated, that it might as well have the effect of being natural and predictable. Um, and they're pushing back against uh, um, the valorization of these masculine uh, traits or identity markers. So for them, they want to reshape cultural norms to normalize and prioritize care and compassion. So for them, why are we going to try to be more like men? Look where that got us for real, right? Like, why don't we just instead um, allocate more prestige and more value to feminine characteristics. And, and so where your liberal feminists will say, 
the problem with the uh, military is that there aren't enough women and we should just put more women in there and demonstrate to the world that what men can do, women can do, if not better. Radical feminists will say, we're all worse off if we do that. Why are we trying to engage in masculinity contests? We should be rejecting militarism in the first place, right? So that, that's like one prominent preoccupation of radical feminists. The other one is um, this belief that men control women's bodies through sex work and pornography and sometimes uh, marriage. So radical feminists tend to have a very negative conception of sex because they see it as the way in which masculinity asserts dominance over femininity, which may or may not be true, but this view is very deterministic and doesn't leave much room for attention to women's agency potentially or to attention to how these norms can be reconfigured. So it's almost as though it's, you know, a hopeless for radical feminists, right? And there is a strain of radical feminism that advocates political lesbianism, like that all heterosexual interactions are going to be inherently interactions of domination. Enter postmodern feminists who are really different from this crop, right? So postmodern feminists reject unitary or binary understandings of the world, including gender, understood as the male sex and the female sex, right? So their argument is biological sex is not natural or fixed. It in itself is a contract, we co construct. We are choosing to designate babies, a male or female, based on our assessment of their genitalia, which is a set of character, like, uh, which is a particular criteria that we have privileged for some reason. But no one is actually inherently born male or female. That's a designation we make, right? And once a designation is attached to them, they then are encouraged to perform their gender. Um, and through constant repetition, it appears fixed. It gets reified. It is naturalized. But actually, for them, gender comes before sex because it is precisely our gendered lens that drives us to designate sex. Um, and for them, if gender is performative, then it can be fluid and we should celebrate that. Obviously, they are not saying, and this is a common misconception of postmodern feminists, they are not saying that you know, gender has no weight or that anyone who says they are a man or a woman can easily switch out of it and identify as, I don't know, a dinosaur. Right? That's not the argument they're making. Obviously, with repeated performance, it becomes internalized, it becomes fixed. But because it was not natural or ahistorical or always there, there is always space to subvert. Um, and that the binary, which is something that post-modern um, feminists really reject, the binary is not natural. We should um, honor uh, people who don't conform to the binary, and we should even encourage it. So the goal is often to denaturalize sex roles and to reject the assumption of heterosexuality as natural or as um, ahistorical. So the common contentions that we encounter in debates or even academic conversations on feminism are, how do you define the problem? What evidence do you use to demonstrate the problem? A lot of feminist debates are about choice um, and the lack thereof of choice and what do we do about it, right? So how do you conceptualize choice? And finally, what strategies should be used? What are the competing interests and how do we prioritize? Apologies for that. I had a bit of a um, disruption. So now that we've gone through thematically what the common contentions are, let's look at the first one. How is the problem defined? Uh, what is the problem, right? Why is this such an important thing? So in debates, we're told that problem identification matters because you are trying to make uh, the problem fit a solution, right? Unlike real life in some ways where you um, understand the problem first and then find a solution for the problem in the debate, it's in reverse, right? So how the group defines the problem and how um, this affects the interventions they support and reject is, I think, uh, core, um, again, differentiating uh, principle in debate. So for example, if you have a motion, this house would require corporate boards to have a quota for women. So a quota is like a fixed number of seats, right? Um, there are various ways of constructing the problem here. 
for prop, you will have to show that the most important problem is a lack of women in leadership positions. And um, for, very, for a set of uh, reasons, one, a lack of women in leadership positions is unjust because there are structural barriers to them getting here. And two, that uh, it's a self-perpetuating cycle because no one advocates for other women um, or policies that benefit women, right? Um, and on op, you will have to ask, and here's where the socialist feminists in some ways um, square off with the liberal feminists, you go, is the problem really with women in leadership positions? Like, is the solution really to just expand the, the narrow circle of elites to let a few women in? What are we really solving with that? And you know, what kind of women are you going to get under those situations? They will likely be very risk averse. They'll likely be pandering to uh, the leadership, right? Might the problem actually be a bit more class-based, right? Um, so like an intersection of class and gender, might the problem be structural disadvantages at the entry and mid-management levels? And in fact, uh, women in leadership positions can't really be counted on to advocate for women. So this presents us with like a false sense of solution, but where the problem is most acute, we're not doing anything, right? Next, <clears throat> how do you conceptualize choice? Which is a big, big um, point of contention. Um, and oftentimes, as I've gone through the list of uh, choices that women are often denied, there are situations where women do not have a wide range of choices. And that's usually what debates tend to cover, right? Um, what does it mean to not have a wide range of choices? What does it mean to exist in a constrained or oppressive context, right? It means that there are penalties, formal or informal, legal, social, economic, for transgressing the rules, right? Not all of this involves having a gun pointed to your head, but it does mean there are costs to not following the rules. This might be in the form of, you know, losing family support. This might be in the form of uh, job discrimination, not getting a promotion, social opprobrium. It's a wide range of costs, right? Um, so all the options involve a potential degree of harm to self and even conformity to rules because these rules are unjust, still involve a potential degree of harm to the self. So there are no good, no good options, actually. Um, and so these situations are sometimes characterized as a false choice. Um, so I think an important question to ask here is in debates, right? What are the circumstances around which the choice is being made? And that will still vary for each constrained context. What types of coercion exist? What type of coercion exists? And will restrictions further help or harm the actors involved? Because it is probably the case that some type of intervention is needed in an oppressive situation, right? But you also want to do no harm. Some inter it doesn't mean that we're doing something we're necessarily helping the situation because it's something that we do can make it worse. It can have unintended consequences. So it's also important to ask whether the intervention further narrows people's options or actually expands their freedom. Because you want to pick the ones that expand freedom, right? Even if not absolutely, but debates are about gradients. So some of the common examples here are debates on sex work or prostitution, religious dress codes for women, um, women staying in potentially abusive relationships or not disclosing abuse or violence. And obviously these are all less than ideal situations and there are various forms of coercion involved economic coercion, um, potentially social coercion, uh, psychological and maybe financial and uh, physical coercion that may be occurring, right? So I want to talk you through one example, which I work with in my work. Uh, the motion is this house would fully decriminalize sex work. All this means is we're lifting all criminal penalties on people who sell sex and people who buy sex and people who are third party. So people facilitating the transaction like establishment owners um, or managers or third parties, right? So some of the questions that you would ask in this situation is, 
is selling sex inherently degrading and dehumanizing when you're trying to characterize the, you know, the harm that's occurring here, right? Some women will say, yes, it is uniquely degrading and dehumanizing because sex is very intertwined with your sense of self. And so you can never really make a neat separation between mind and body and your essential self and the sex act. The way you might be able to do for other forms of embodied labor like domestic work or factory work, yes, those labor in those for labors involve some degree of intimacy, but not the kind of intimacy that's involved in sex. Some women don't think so, right? So you have to account for that spectrum. I mean, some some people think I'm just selling sexual services, like I'm not selling my body, I'm not selling myself, right? So is it different from any other form of labor? You could say yes, you could say no. That's one question you might ask. Regardless of that though, what are the realistic alternatives? And are they better? Can we be sure that they are better on all such that we want to ban this entire category of workers, right? Because the realistic alternatives are likely to be domestic work, factory work, working as sales clerks. Um, these jobs, pay significantly less on, by the hour than sex work, and they are far less flexible than sex work. So if someone is a single parent and, need to spend, and needs to spend time with their kids, or if they do not want to be away from their kids to work as domestic workers in other families, what if they find, you know, sex work do not necessarily be fun, but a bit more um, potentially rewarding, than domestic work, which they might find to be like a form of drudgery or kind of dehumanizing. How would you characterize the alternatives, right? And then trying to identify the problem and pinpoint that situation. Some people will say the problem with sex work is, again, the fact that women are being paid for sex means that sex is a vehicle for exercising masculine control over women's bodies. And it's harmful to the sex worker and also harmful to um, women as a category of people in general, because it entrenches the idea of male entitlement to women's bodies. Um, and some people will say, like I do, that a lot of the problems in sex work and vulnerabilities in sex work stem from women's lack of control over their working conditions. So obviously the clients and uh, third parties have a lot of leverage over them and the cops have a lot of leverage over them because what they're doing is seen as illegal, right? And so they can't report abuse because A, they won't be believed, B, they will be get, they'll get extorted and potentially arrested themselves. And so people can't take advantage of them. Police demand bribes or sexual favors in exchange for, um, so I actually shouldn't call it that, police sexually assault them in exchange for not arresting them. Um, or because, you know, they, where will they go? Um, there's no consequence on the cops, right? So some people will argue it's actually the lack of control over their working conditions. And if they were able to do this and transact more freely, uh, those things would happen. And you know, even if you criminalize only their clients and not the sex workers, because they need the money as we've established, they will still be transacting underground because they won't want their clients to be found out. They won't want to lose clients, right? And cops will still have power over them because the cops can still harass them or their clients. The next question is, what are the effects on women in general? And uh, is that something, you know, the potential entrenchment of the patriarchy? Is that unique to sex work? Um, and is there no space within sex work for, you know, some of these norms to actually be reconfigured? Because some people will argue that it's women's bodies and selves that are sold in sex work. And some people will argue, no, it is the fantasy of that that is sold, but that in itself is empowered. Women are already expected to provide sex for free in the context of marriages. Um, and that's under like a masculine, bar uh, quite patriarchal bargain, right? You're comparing different types of patriarchal bargains that women are forced to enter into. And one requires them to submit fully to one man in exchange for his protection and support. And this one requires them to be able to have sex a little bit more on their own terms and have, and, you know, make money off it and uh, have a bit more control over that money. Um, and that might potentially be more empowering. Again, that's part of the debate. And depending on how you characterize the problem, how you characterize sex work itself, what intervention should be prioritized? Having said that in my work, I feel very strongly that we should fully decriminalize it. And if people want to talk to me a bit more about this topic, I'm very happy to, okay. 
the next, um, you know, general uh, set of contentions in the debate are what strategies should we be using? So we have um, the debate about radical approaches versus more socially acceptable or reformist ones. And broadly the way these debates go is that uh, socially acceptable reformist ones are more likely to succeed and we can gradually build on them and they tend to pro protect the most vulnerable or address the most urgent, sometimes components of the problem. Whereas some people say socially acceptable reformist approaches don't go far enough. Um, they're very easily co-opted. They benefit only the most privileged or most elite members of minority or disenfranchised groups. And they are not actually, a, you know, they're not actually a gateway to more rights. In fact, they foreclose more rights because there is a sense that the battle has already been won or people lose interest. Like once the more privileged members of minority groups get what they want or what they need, they have no incentive to fight for more, which is why we need more radical approaches, which are more transformative, which are more distributive, um, where the impacts are felt more by the most vulnerable actors, right? Um, so a, a slightly different example to what I've been saying is the abortion debates. I think it's, it's still, it falls under like a strategy question. So a common strategy of um, abortion campaigners is to focus a lot on innocent figures, right? Uh, situations of incest, uh, children being raped or raped in general, or situations where um, the, per the pre pregnant person's life is in danger. And, uh, the argument for that is you're able to illustrate the urgency of the situation. And you're also able to illustrate the innocence of the person involved and their, you know, their, their state as a victim. And even conservative forces will have a hard time arguing against that because you can't victim blame a, a, a person who's been victimized by rape, for example, or someone whose life is threatened by pregnancy. So you're more likely to get what you want, right? You're more likely to get the uh, policy passed than you are saving lives. Of course, the opposition to that will say, but you are creating two classes of uh, people, usually women here, right? Uh, good women who are deserving of compassion and deserving of sympathy and deserving of rights. And you re-stigmatize, if not worsen the stigma on everyone else. And this isn't actually an effective gateway. It's going to end here. Um, and it will be so much harder to win abortion rights for everyone else because it will be seen as we've already extended it to the group of people who deserve it. Everyone else should, is to blame for their pregnancies. And if you don't belong to this you know, set of innocent people, if you don't provide a credible performance of innocence or victimhood, um, you are going to be shamed and uh, not allowed access to abortion. And we do know that innocence attaches itself more to certain bodies rather than others, right? What is going to be the impact of this on people who don't outwardly appear innocent, sex workers, people who don't conform to standards of modesty, etc. The next um, strategy is for groups that are minorities or disenfranchised or excluded. Do they highlight their difference or their similarity from mainstream. Um, and this is a big debate uh, in the gay rights movement, for example, the centrality of marriage advocacy to LGBT campaigning. Some people might argue that this is an attempt to extend what is predominantly a heterosexual lifestyle and institution to homosexuals and to suggest that they too can have stable productive families they too in some ways can take part in this heterosexual um, dream, right? But what about many members of the LGBT community whose sexual and gender identities don't necessarily lend themselves to that kind of life? Like people whose sexuality is more fluid, um, queers, individuals who don't want marriage or who don't conform necessarily to the idea of your respectable gay personality, like middle-class, consumerist, family-oriented, willing to raise kids? Shouldn't the focus be on that wider range 
of identities and um, you know ways of being rather than just narrowly extending heterosexual lifestyles. Obviously the other side is, but what if this is something that people actually want, right? And also it's a sequencing thing. The moment certain rights are available to certain groups of people and not others, that already sends a very strong signal of inferiority and superiority. So perhaps we should correct that first before pushing for a wider range. Obviously the other side is gonna say, you're not gonna get your wider range because um, you've already created hierarchies of humanity. You've already normalized a version that is acceptable and created like further hierarchies within that community. So in keeping with this question of, should we focus on um, criminal justice-based solutions? Uh, you know, even if the victims might prefer either mediation or something more like economic empowerment to give them a better fallback position um, where the criminal justice solution might actually make things worse is, is one side will argue. A common question also is like, what should be Me Too's overarching strategy? Because Me Too actually started out as, you know, a storytelling uh, strategy where individuals would tell each other about their experiences of sexual harassment and violence as a way to achieve some form of catharsis, but also to validate each other's experiences. Because the most common thing that um, sexual violence survivors hear is that it didn't happen, you imagined it, it's untrue, and just people refusing to believe them. So simply telling your story in a group setting or to other people was powerful. Uh, it was a validating experience. But it didn't really begin as a strategy of like outing or exposing specific abusers or suing them or getting them arrested, although it has evolved in that direction. So some people might argue that that component of the Me Too movement does not benefit, you know, many women who are not seen as believable or credible in a legal setting and kind of sets them up for failure. That might not even be the solution some of them want, right? Like reliving that trauma in a courtroom. Um, and it again privileges certain types of people who are more likely to be seen as innocent and believable. Also, the focus on calling people out publicly creates a very adversarial context and leaves women vulnerable to retaliation or hidden forms of discrimination in the workplace, like people no longer want to mentor women or have one-on-one -on -one meetings with them, which harms women, benefits men, right? And so all of these like unintended consequences. I'm not saying one side is better than the other, but I'm saying there has been a conversation about the focus on calling out and uh, carceral justice approaches in, in, in the movement. Finally, um, another common theme of debates is partnerships. Who should we work with to achieve these goals, right? Should feminists work with religious institutions? And I think the answer here is it depends. Uh, sometimes religious institutions have a wide reach, have wide access, better than governments in some cases. They have massive credibility in communities. Um, they are more likely to be listened to if religious leaders say domestic violence is bad, rape is bad, as opposed to feminists who are in some cases associated with the West, associated as, as you know, threats to masculine authority. At the same, and so you might actually be saving lives this way and, and getting more buy-in. At the same time, there's a ceiling to the kind of buy-in you get because the kind of feminist um, goals that these religious institutions are likely to back will be very limited, right? And they're likely to revolve around men's role as women's protectors rather than as women being inherently equal to men or inherently deserving of power. Um, and what happens is once you've legitimized them as allies, it then becomes a bit harder to criticize them because you're dependent on their support, right? And when they do espouse sexist ideas, so maybe they might support a campaign against domestic violence or the campaign against rape or even you know, early marriage, but they will not back abortion, they will not back sex work, they are unlikely to back LGBT rights. 
then what happens, right? Because you've already increased their legitimacy and credibility by collaborating with them. Um, but then there's also the debate of uh, what about women who are also religious, who see themselves as feminists? By not working with them or their institutions, you might be sending a signal that there's no place for them in feminism. And that's a missed opportunity uh, to reform these institutions and also like to work for the benefit of all women. Right? Another common debate is the role of men in feminism. Obviously, we need them as allies in some contexts. It's, it's a bit similar to the religious debate. In some contexts, men have a lot of credibility and uh, what we want is buy-in. We need to persuade them and they are more likely to listen to each other, at least in the first instance. Um, at the same time, this is also about access to platforms and voices and uh, you know, access to a set of experiences that men might not have uh, that makes it hard for them to speak for women. Uh, fi finally, another interesting question is uh, the role of corporations in feminist or LGBT advocacy, because being woke is, in some cases, profitable these days. A uh, good case study for this is the corporatization, to some extent, of pride parades. So you now have companies like Goldman Sachs and all these other companies um, you know, investing in, in pride parades, talking about their diversity, um, credentials within their company, like how many LGBT individuals they have, et cetera. The criticism to this is it depoliticizes and de-radicalizes these events. So what you have are like very narrow and capitalist conceptions of empowerment. Your white, middle-class, attractive, macho, gym-going <laughs> gay men but what about those who don't conform to these more respectable forms? Also, it kind of whitewashes a lot of the complicities of these organizations in the oppression of, you know, gay individuals um, because they are likely to donate to conservative political parties, work with governments that enforce, you know, repressive laws against um, gay individuals or are complicit in the extraction of um, you know, resources, the dispossession of communities, all of which affect um, LGBT individuals who are already vulnerable by virtue of their sex and gender status, made more vulnerable by poverty. And again, go back to intersectionality, right? So, okay, they support these causes on their own terms in a very like, deodorized superficial way and they get a lot of credit for that but what is obscured is their complicity in the suffering of this community as well so maybe we shouldn't be working with them and at the same time that is a lot of money that is legitimacy and credibility so it's it's um it's a dilemma okay um let's now go on to the last topic which is building an evidence case. So I want to introduce you to some just basic facts, right? To illustrate the gender gap. And uh, the UN Women website is a great source of these facts. They update it quite regularly. Um, so predictably, only one in four parliamentarians is female. Only 21 women have served as head of state or government ever. Only 70% of government ministers are women. A majority oversee social sector. So women get stereotyped as, you know, education or health or family-oriented um, cabinet ministers. Majority of the people still believe that men need better leaders than women. That's a political data. In terms of uh, economic data, only one in five landholders are women, but women are actually half the agricultural labor force in developing countries. And uh, women's wages represent between 17 and 90 percent of men. Um, this is both in terms of uh, how much they are paid for the same kind of job, but also that women's jobs tend to get paid significantly less than men, not because they're inherently less valuable, but because they're coded as feminized, as something that we should be able to extract from women for free anyway, like as an extension of their invisible work. So it helps to be armed with this kind of data, uh, but that's not enough to win the debate. So obviously try to read up on women's representation in corporate settings and STEM, 
um, try to read up on sexual assault data, on reporting data, on various innovations that countries have undertaken to address these problems, what do they look like, and there's a proposal to have female only justices, safe rape trials, etc. So be familiar with empirical stuff. But usually, you need to tell the story behind the data. So it's not enough to just throw this data, although it's useful to demonstrate that this is not just a subjective rant that you are making, but you have to fill in the gaps, right? Like, why is it that this is just a number of women you have? Like, why is it that the choice of the electorate in this case is actually a misinformed choice? Like, aren't people entitled to their choice? Are there particular factors that are distortive uh, and that biases them to make incorrect assessments. What are these? What, what do they look like? So there's a lot of like research there on how likability and credibility statistics are biased, uh, how women come across as either too aloof, too serious, too intimidating, bossy, or too soft and too weak, and they kind of don't know where to place themselves, right? It's this weird double bind. Or women are seen to be. Uh, also responsible for their kids and kind of being bad mothers if they take on too, um, you know, intense a job or a role. But it's never asked of men, right? Women are criticized for how they dress. Men don't seem to run into this problem. Like Boris Johnson in the UK has horrible hair and no one cares. Um, and so uh, these are, you, you need to be able to like pack your analysis with these kinds of qualitative uh, assessments to back the quantitative data you have. You have to tell a story and persuade the judge that your assessment of the problem is correct. Okay, I'm gonna end here. I hope this was helpful and I hope um, you know to run into some of you in the coming months. So take care everyone. <laughs>